Welcome, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the Palm Springs Air Museum, and welcome to another in our continuing series commemorating the 65 years since the end of World War II. My name is Greg Kinney. I'm the program coordinator here at the museum, and it's my honor and privilege to get to open up these programs. And I always do so by uh, having a couple of things that I think are very, very important. And the first, of course, being introducing the two groups, the two high schools that have come here today to help us out. Our chorus, we've got Palm Desert High School. Thank you very much for being here. And our color guard today is from Cathedral City High School. Thank you very much. And now if I could uh, prevail upon our audience, if uh, we could all please rise and remove your hats. Thank you very much, Cathedral City High School and Palm Desert High School. At this point, I have a few other thank yous I'd like to extend at the beginning of this program. Of course, thank you to uh, all our museum volunteers. These are the folks here today with the white shirts and the white name badges. These are folks that could be anywhere but choose to be here and choose to give up their time. So. I always like to thank them. These are the folks that really bring it all to life for us. So to our volunteers, thank you very much. I also, of course, will thank our museum board and museum members. If you're here at the museum today, you enjoy the planes, you enjoy the people, you enjoy the programs, please do think about becoming a member. It's your support that makes it all possible. So please do think about that. If you're not already a member, and if you are, thank you very much. I'd also especially like to thank the sponsors of these programs. These programs commemorating the 65 years since the end of World War II. We've had a special set of sponsors. You see them all listed there in your programs. These people went above and beyond. They gave of their resources to make these happen. So I'd like to thank them. And the biggest thank you that I'd like to, of course, ex to extend is to our veterans. If you're in our audience today and you are a veteran of the armed services, if you would just raise your hand. Thank you very much.
And if I could prevail upon you to do it one more time, if you're in our audience and you're a veteran of the armed service and we're in World War II, if you would please raise your hand and be recognized. Thank you very much. Well, I think you've heard about as much as you want to hear from me. We want to get to the meat of the program, right? We're going to hear about the island hopping campaign in the Pacific. And to start that off for us today, we have Mr. Blaine Mack, P-38 pilot, World War II veteran of the war in the Pacific, and also Palm Springs Air Museum volunteer. So without any further ado, Mr. Blaine Mack. I wander a lot, thank you. Today is a, a very special occasion for those of us who are, uh, shall we say, remember World War II well. Because this was the period of time, what we're talking about today, when things really began to happen out in the Pacific. And as for those who are not really up to the the workings of World War II, I remind you that we were fighting in those days on what really, we said, always said two sides, but that wasn't the case. There were five fronts going on simultaneously. And today we're gonna talk just a little bit about a couple of those and how things came to pass that allowed us to win World War II. Probably the worst conflagration that the world has ever seen, and I hope it stays that way. This gives you a map of the Pacific, and it's very difficult to ever arrive at a map that people can really see and understand what went on. What we have is one of the entire Pacific area that was involved in World War II. Now, of course, it doesn't include the rest of it. And it's almost, but not quite accurate. As with all maps, it's subject to a certain amount of fluctuation as to where they go when you're putting in boundaries. But if you look at that, everything that's within the confines of that red line that runs along there, in June of 1942, belonged to the Japanese. As a matter of fact, it was often jokingly stated that that Pacific Ocean there it was that great big Japanese lake. That's how much they owned. Because we had been driven back, we were unprepared for World War II, and everybody knows that. We've covered the early parts of that. What we're covering now is where we left off a few weeks ago, which was the point at which the Japanese were stopped. And so today we are going to start where the worm turned, where we finally began to take it back from them. A very, very tough battle, and those of you who were here a little bit earlier and saw some of the stuff on, on Guadalcanal and, and Iwo and those places, if you didn't know before, I'm sure you understood what a terribly difficult task that was. And we paid for it very heavily. We lost very nearly a half a million Americans killed in World War II. What we're going to talk about is clear up in the far, far northeast corner of that red line up there for right now for the starters, <laughs> which is where the Aleutian Islands are. It was kind of interesting the other day in the paper, uh, Denise Goolsby, who has done such a spectacular job of bringing this out day after day after day uh, and talking to all of those people. And it, she stated there that the, early in the game, <coughs> And I pulled out a map and showed her this little tiny dot over there, and I said, that's where I was. And so that's where we're going to start today, with the Aleutian Islands. And this is what they look like. They come down from out of the uh, Alaskan Peninsula, uh, and, and you can see where it starts, right there at Umnak. And it's usually called by two or three different names, but that's what we always do, was Umnak. And from there on out, uh, that's the Aleutian chain. And all of that at one time was under fire from the Japanese. And we're going to talk a little bit about some of those things because they're historical. They're really historical events 
that almost nobody heard of, except those of us who were unfortunate enough to have spent some time there. <clears throat> In June 2nd of 1942, less than six months after the bombing of Pearl Harbor, the Japanese were intent upon wiping out, particularly the Navy, that's what they worried about, was the Navy. Because, why? Because like Britain, Japan is surrounded by water. That's all they knew was navies. So to them, this was a matter of life and death, and rightfully so. Their problem was that on the 18th of April of 1942, one of my all-time heroes, Jimmy Doolittle, led a raid of 16 B-25s and hit the islands of Japan, around Tokyo, Yokohama, and thereabouts. And that shook the Japanese right to their knees because they had been promised, faithfully, that no enemy would ever reach the shores of Japan. So therefore, the plan was to stop that from ever having, happening again. How are you going to do that? Two ways. You're going to put up a defense so they can't get there, and the next thing you're going to do is destroy the Navy that's going to take them there. So they're going to do this all at one time. And they're going to do it in this way. The first thing we're going to do is hit with a small force in the Aleutian Islands. Why? That's mainland USA. The next day, is the Battle of Midway. And when we talk about these things, it's really, if you know what you're talking about, almost impossible to separate those two. One was a big, dynamic battle. The other was a small one. The one, and still today, scholars, none of whom know what they're talking about, I might add, cannot decide whether the attack in the Aleutians was a, a, a feint, a, a, dis, a distraction, or whether they actually intended to stay there. My opinion is, yes, both. Uh, so they hit a, set a carrier force up there, a small one, the rest of it, they all went out together from from the Curiel Islands, the southern Curiel Islands, out to sea, and then split off, and, and the small force went north to, to strike uh, the Aleutian Islands and to take them. And the other one went on to Midway to eliminate the American Navy. Well, they partially succeeded at one thing. They completely failed at the other. This shows one of the very first counterattacks on the Aleutian Islands. They bombarded Dutch Harbor and eliminated everything there. The Dutch Harbor was clear up further north on the eastern edge, right near the peninsula itself. Then they attacked Attu, which is what you're looking at right here. And they, we had very little force on Attu or on Kiska, either one, and they took both of them very quickly. And many of our people, the small number that we had there, we never heard from again. Now they have, for the first time since the War of 1812, foreign armies had taken American soil. This was to be a historic thing, never before. Do they really want this? You better believe they did. Because now they have a foothold. You could go island hopping up there all you want, and all of a sudden you're in what now is Alaska. It was Alaska then, but it hadn't been very long. And you're now on Canadian soil, but more than that, you're within striking distance of the city of Seattle. So this is important. This is what it looks like about
about eight months out of the year, nine months out of the year, that happens to be the island of Antu, which is the furthest east, the end of the chain. A terribly rugged, mountainous, terrible place to fly out of. And what you're looking at there is one of the few good days you'll ever see. They always show these pictures of the Aleutians with the sun shining, but they have to wait there a year and a half before they can take that picture. There, if you look closely, you can see the B-25s there. That's the 77th Bomb Squad, uh, which was still there. One of our uh, members here might even be flying one of those airplanes. That, that's a Navy contingent of PV-2s. They were split in half, part on the island I was on, Chemi, part on, on that too. These are some of what we were putting up with. Now what we're going to look at here is the retaking of that. Because it was less than a year later that we retook that. Now here's where it's difficult to tell this story. Because in the meantime, this battle of Midway is going on. So in order to try to put it across to you, I have to jump times and then go back to the Battle of Midway. So if you uh, give me that opportunity, I'll do that. Because this can't be separated here. This went on from June 2nd of 1942, clear till 36 hours after the war ended, because that's when we found out about it. What you're looking at right now on the screen is the final bonsai attack that the Japanese made on A2. After we launched our invasion fleet in probably the worst possible conditions, it's hard to imagine what it was like. And we didn't have they, I shouldn't say we, because I wasn't there at that time. They didn't even have proper boots and shoes in this kind of weather. But they made it anyway. And another thing that comes right along with that is that very few, even good historians, realize that at the Battle of Attu, the percentage of losses in the American ranks was the highest per capita in World War II. The other thing that most people don't know is that there was only one surviving Japanese out of this attack that you're looking at right now. One. And the only reason he survived was because he had lost his gun and he couldn't get to it fast enough before he was captured. Or he would have committed Harry Carey. This was the last bonsai attack when they took the island back. How crucial were these islands? I've already told you half of the story. The other half of the story is that by this time, late in the war, not right here, but another year later, we had all kinds of aircraft that could reach the Curiel Islands and back out of Batu and Chenya. And they not only could, but they did with regularity. And that was the beginning of the end for the North Pacific battle. This is what it was like flying out of there on a good day. That's a, an aircraft from the 54th Fighter Squadron. This is what my squadron looked like when I joined it. Those were P-40s. I never <laughs> flew that thing, I'm glad to say. Uh, but look at the kind of terrain we were flying at. That's, that big mountain is right off the end of that slippery runway you're looking at there. This is also, now that's on app two, and that shows you the, do you notice the similarity in these pictures? Every one of them has all kinds of white on it. <laughs> yeah. That snow melts every year shortly after the 4th of July before the next one comes in. That's one of our airplanes flying there. I'm not sure. I think the, the, I'm in the one on the left there, but I'm, I'm really not quite sure. And these are our saviors right here. You know, sometime back, we were going to, I won't go through the whole story, but a man said, well, I wasn't uh, uh, in combat. I was only a PBY pilot. And I said, let me tell you this. There is not such a thing as only a PBY pilot. Because these are the ones that brought our people home when they couldn't get home on their own. 
And this is a picture of the Kuril Island, some 800 miles away, the target for today. That's a member of the 404th Bomb Squadron there. Now, while all of this was going on, back at the very beginning, we were in the Battle of Midway. And the Battle of Midway was something else. Earlier, I gave a little talk on, on Yamamoto, and, and I won't go to, through that much more, except to say that he was the one that planned the Battle of Midway. There was only one thing that he didn't know, and none of them did either. <laughs> We had broken their code. We were reading their mail with regularity every day. They changed their code on the 1st of August every year. And by the 2nd of August, we were reading their mail once more. So that when the Battle of Midway, the problem was, the first problem that they had, our, our American people had, was they knew that the Japanese were going to do something and they knew what it was going to be, but they didn't know where or when. As soon as they opened the envelope, so to speak, as we like to say, they got it, the when. And the next paragraph had the where. And it was going to be midway. So instead of walking, or shall we say, floating into the trap that the Japanese had sent for our Navy, we skirted around and came in from the other direction. They never found it. And all of a sudden, they, instead of wiping out the American fleet, were on the defensive. Now what you're looking at here, the man on your right, my left, is Ensign Gay. Now Ensign Gay, who retired many years later as a, uh, as a rear admiral, had the distinction of being the only individual in the world, in the world, who ever saw the entire Battle of Midway. Because he got shot down, excuse me, coming in on his pass. He was a TBD uh, pilot, and he lost his crew members. If you look back, if you look at the aircraft carriers that we have on display in the model, those larger airplanes are TBDs. And that would have taken place before the Battle of Midway because on the very first strikes at the Battle of Midway, we lost every TBD, every one. He was in one of them and happened to be the only one out of that whole bunch that survived. And he floated around for three days, two, two and a half days really, hiding under his dinghy whenever he had to. Well, all of the war was going on all around him. Spectacular view that nobody else in the world ever had a chance to see. Probably nobody else wanted to see it either. These are the ones that finally ended up being the heroes of the Battle of Midway. And as you walked in this doorway, the front door here, if you happen to look at my only regret about this whole thing, this is a beautiful mural. My only regret about it is that it's up high when people are walking in the door and hardly anybody ever sees it unless it's pointed out to them. But if you haven't already seen it, go, when you leave, take a look in the lobby and just before you go out the door, turn around and look up. And you will see a perfect painting, a Stan Stokes painting of the Battle of Midway. And what they're doing is telling you in in a picture, one of the most fascinating, somebody up there is taking, looking out for me, pictures that you can ever see. Because what happened, both sides are looking for the other side. They knew roughly where they, we knew roughly where they were, but couldn't find them. The weather was not real good, not cooperating at all. They didn't really know where we were. They were completely confused, looking for us, because we hadn't been where they thought we were going to be. And Commander McCluskey was leading a flight of, of SVDs, we were right over there. And he was out on patrol and hadn't found it yet. And they were getting ready to go back home, because they're starting to run low on fuel. 
And he decided on the spur of the moment to make one more, he figured he could get 12 more minutes. So they made one more small orbit around there looking for this thing. And just as he was getting ready to head back to the carrier and take his flight with him, all of a sudden they opened up in this big hole in the clouds and there right underneath him was the entire Japanese fleet. They rolled over and the picture you see there is saying, oh my God, there they are. And he's going down after. We always thought it was very sporting of the Japanese incidentally, if you look at that for them to paint that great big red meatball on their carriers. <laughs> so it, it's a lot easier target to see than, than something that's the same color as the wire. But at any rate, uh, and that was the beginning of the end. Within no time at all, within literally minutes of the four Japanese carriers, three of them were on their way down. And that in itself is quite a story because you see those four carriers happen to be the same four that led the attacks on Pearl Harbor. And if that isn't payback, I don't know what is. Two of them went to the bottom almost immediately. The other one, nobody quite knows what happened because everything went goofy in the thing and all of a sudden they started going around in circles all by itself. And the crew was going overboard and everything else, but nobody seemed to have any control over it. And the Japanese themselves sunk a submarine, sunk that one. But they didn't get the fourth one. The Hiryu was the name of it. H-I-R-Y-U. Well, everybody was running low on fuel, and they'd already made two or three attacks. And it was a long distance between those carriers, between the fleets, I should say. The ne very next... Uh, morning, the hurry you launched aircraft and sunk one of ours. But it was too little, too late, because our guys were already on the way there, and the hurry you went to the bottom that same, very same morning. And the consequences of this are something that most people just gloss over, and, and yet and understand when so. The Japanese had on those four carriers their very best, most experienced pilots and crews, the same people that had been working over China for years, the same people that bombed Pearl Harbor. Uh, it was a tough thing. But where did they land? In the water. Who's going to pick them up? Not me. Not anybody else. So at the, the real, to me, the real critical thing about the Battle of Midway was the fact that the Japanese Naval Air Force lost the cream of the cross. And they never recovered from that right there. This is one of the cruisers, and I forget the name, that was sunk there at the Battle of Midway. And this is the Hurrium, the next morning, just before it went under. This was ours, uh, Yorktown, I believe, that uh, was sunk just shortly before the Hurrium went down. And that shows you what it looks like, how sad it is when you lose one of those. The battles of Midway and the Aleutians, the Battle of Midway has always been termed as the turning point in the Pacific War, and I believe that's correct. But the strange thing is that at that time, nobody really termed it that. It was only in retrospect that people began with that. Because there's one thing that, that, that everybody that was in the Pacific, I will guarantee you, you will agree with us. You never knew what was going on anywhere else. How could you? 
And we didn't have any satellite. They didn't have TV. We didn't have cell phones. Did you know that? <laughs> there was no way of communicating. We had a hard time communicating with that too, 40 miles away. I had to happen to be in a position that the only method of contacting our fighter squadrons on the other island. Uh, so there was no way we could recognize this as being the turning point. But we know that there were certain things. The one that stopped them from going south, the one that turned around and headed them back down into the center, and then from there on, uh, the war was won, but the worst fighting was yet ahead. And with that, I'd like to <coughs> introduce Bob Andrade, who's going to tell you a little bit about where things went from there. That was a great minute. Okay, uh, anybody hear me okay? <clears throat> okay, we're looking back at the map there. Um, when, the, when the war started, um, Washington under Marshall, <clears throat> the first idea was to help Britain. In fact, he wanted to put the Pacific Ocean in the, um, in the back burner. But, but he couldn't do that because uh, Admiral King went to Roosevelt and said, no, we can't do that because the Japanese had come down and they took down Borneo and look, look, look what's next is Australia. Now, if he would have, uh, if he would have uh, stayed over there in, in, in Europe and not defended that, the islands there, we would have, we would have lost New Zealand and Australia. <clears throat> so, so what they, they finally did was to, to uh, they planned to, uh, they planned to invade Santa Cruz Island and Tulagi. And one of the patrol planes was out there and they spotted uh, a field being built in a place called Guadalcanal. Nobody ever heard of that before. <clears throat> and they thought if they, if they, uh, if they completed that field, we'd never ever get to defend Australia. So they, they finally formed a, a, a task force. Okay. Guadalcanal was uh, code Operation Cactus. And they, they formed a, okay, there's a picture of Guadalcanal, and if you can see, check this. There's Tulagi, and there's Guadalcanal. There's a better picture of it. Uh, also, too, there's uh, a Henderson Field. You can see that in the center up there. And that's, and that's what we were headed for. So that's where they found the Japanese field. It was, it was, it was being uh, completed by, uh, by the laborers there. And this right here is, is the task force under uh, uh, Admiral Fletcher. And we had the USS Saratoga, the Enterprise, and the Wasp. And Kelly Turner was the head of the landing forces. And what they did is they, on the 7th of August, they landed the 1st Marine Division. And guess what? They marooned them. When they got, when they got ashore there, the whole fleet, pulled, the whole task force pulled out. The, there's still the controversy over this, but they found out that the, the Japanese fleet, they didn't know where they were. So they wanted to get out of there. So, so how did the first division uh, survive? <clears throat> well, they when they landed, they, they the Japanese were completely a surprise. So they went into the jungle, and that meant that those old Marines they got to eat all their food. 
so basically they, they eat food and I think they had a little sake too there, but um, but all they had was a little, little, little a place there. Now this right here are the, uh, the I'm not gonna try to pronounce those names, okay? Just take it for granted, that is the, the Japanese forces that uh, in the, uh, the Solomon Islands. <clears throat> now this right here, I don't know if you recognize uh, Rear Admiral uh, McCain, but his first big responsibility was to form the Cactus Air Force. And he, it, it, all it was was just, a, uh, a, the first part was just a, a small uh, escort carrier. What he did, he took, took the carrier and those planes to Guadalcanal, they were still working on the field now, so they, could, they couldn't actually get there. So when he, so he was actually, of course you recognize the name McCain, don't you? The presidential hopeful's grandfather. So when he took that, that, that uh, Cactus Air Force, he turned it over to, oops, he turned, he turned it over to, uh, to General Vandegrift, which was the head of the 1st Marine Division. And then eventually, uh, General Geiger took over the force, okay? <clears throat> now take a look at that. That was Cactus Air Force. There was uh, 19 F-4Fs, Wildcat, and 14, I mean, excuse me, 12 SPDs. Would you believe they took off that ship there? How could they do that? Okay, on the other side, you can't see it, but there was a catapult, one at a time. And um, the whole idea, too, these were inexperienced. They were green pilots. We had to, we had to get the Cactus Air Force started. So these, these pilots were green pilots. And they took every plane off there, one at a time. They finally, they finally got to, uh, uh, to Guadalcanal, rather, to Henderson Field. <coughs> So the rest of the, uh, now this right here is uh, Lieutenant Colonel Mangrum. He, he was in charge of the SPD, the, uh, the dive bombers, and Major John Smith was in charge of the, was commander of the fighter planes. And this is what, this is what uh, Henderson Field looked like before we landed, while the Japanese had it. <clears throat> Incidentally, uh, Henderson Field is named after Loftus, uh, Henderson, a uh, hero, uh, the SPD hero of Midway Island uh, battle. So this is what it looked like. If you look. Now these right here are the planes that we had, the Americans had on, on Guadalcanal eventually. And there are, believe it or not, six of those airplanes we have here. Now these are, this is what the Japanese had. They, they had the Betty, the, the Zero, the Val, the Kate, and that big uh, uh, bomb, uh, seaplane. Now this right here, these are probably some of the important people of, of Guadalcanal. The first one there is John Smith, Bob Gator, and Mary Carl. The interesting story there is you can see they have the DFC medals that, that uh, the, uh, the Admiral had presented to them. And in this particular uh, case right here, uh, John Smith, that's the uh, Gator, and, and Mary Carl had just got shot down and took five days to get back to Guadalcanal, rather to Henderson Field. And then uh, General Geiger said that, that John Smith has just shot his 16th plane down. And Mary Carl says, General, ground him for five days. They're in competition. So, so it ended out, uh, after the battle was over with, John Smith has shot down 19 planes, Bob Gaylor 13, and Barry Carl 16. Wow. Okay, I think you recognize this man right here. This is, this, is my, this is my hero. And that's Joe Foss. Joe Foss shot down 26 Japanese planes in that little F4F. Unbelievable person. Uh, 
they say that he actually actually turned off two of his guns because he was so accurate on shooting down places to save, to save ammunition. He developed, he developed it, uh, the, the, actually developed himself the deflection shooting where he would, he would time, he would, he would have to, like a computer, he would have to time the, the speed of the, uh, of the Japanese plane, which way he was turning, try to get him into a turn so he could shoot in front of him. It's called a deflection shot. And he's unbelievable at that. And if you see this right here, the, uh, that right there is the Medal of Honor. And I don't know if you heard the story about that Medal of Honor, but he, he was doing a speaking engagement and uh, he got to the gate and security took it away from him because it had sharp edges. They didn't know what it was, can you believe that? And that's, that's another story, but uh, uh, that's a true story, by the way. You can probably find it on the internet. This, this right here, uh, I, I had access to, to a lot of the documents, and this right here is the document of the, um, um, if you look at, if you can read this at all, you can't read that, it's October the, October the 23rd, and these are the different squadrons that was involved in this battle. And, and uh, this, this particular day, the weather cleared and the Japanese sent everything they had to destroy uh, Henderson Field. And uh, so all he, we had to go up to meet, meet all, I forget the amount of planes that they had, but they had a whole sky full of them, both Betty Bombers and Zeros. So there's Joe Foss that day, he, he got uh, four shot down. And you probably never heard of this guy right here, Frederick Payne, but he's one of our members here at the museum. He's a, a general. He lives in the, uh, Ranch Mirage, and he will be 100 years old this year. And he's the oldest living age. But anyway, it's funny that they're all in that same battle. Now this. Now this right here is, as you can see, that's uh, there's pain. Uh, there's pain right there, and that's the uh, airplane back there is the F four F, and this man right here, his name is Joe Bauer, an unbelievable person. They called him the coach. He was commander of VMF uh, uh, two twelve on Guadalcanal, and uh, he. They, didn't let him fly because, you know, being the commander, he did a lot, had a lot of paperwork to do. But uh, he went up four times and got 11 airplanes. He got the Medal, Medal of Honor. Now this right here, I don't know if you recognize, these are called the Coast Watchers. Uh, the Japanese would take off from Rabaul and all those little islands in, in uh, the Solomons, as they would go over these Coast Watchers, would, would uh, kind of judge their speed and their height, and they would, they would radio to Henderson Field, and they would be ready for them when they, get, when they got so close, they would climb up to about, about uh, 20,000 feet, and then come down on them. So, very important people. In fact, re nobody really heard of the Coast Watchers until, until uh, uh, Kennedy uh, ran for president, because they, they saved him. And this, this right here, uh, the reason I have this one up here is because over there in yellow there, this is a story uh, that uh, a conger and this Japanese pilot uh, parachuted down together. It's quite a story, it's, it's in the a book we have upstairs. And as they both landed together in the water at the same time, a launch came over and picked up conger and uh, they, uh, they went to shoot the Japanese pilot. He said, no, no, we, have, we haven't gotten the intelligence. We need him. So they try to get him out of there, and he takes his gun, and he points it at Conger, and he pulls the trigger, or it's just wet, nothing happens. He tries to shoot himself, and he tries to drown himself, because, uh, of course, you all know that the Japanese, they had to commit suicide, and uh, that's, they had to do it, but he couldn't do it. So they, they finally knocked him out and uh, took him as, as prisoner. That's quite a story. I've been involved with these people over here so for a while. This right here, a couple of books that we have upstairs. Uh, I was involved, uh, myself and uh, General Payne were involved in this, um, uh, doing, uh, 
I'll get it. I think like I've got the wrong hair. Can, can you correct that over there? Yeah, there we go. <clears throat> and there's the Cactus, Cactus Air Force there. Of course, the Cactus Air Force lasted only so long, and then, and then it, um, and then as, as time went on, remember that the, we landed there on the seventh of August. And it was in uh, it was in February that the Japanese finally left. And you talk about a miracle with how they had held Guadalcanal. Uh, that they, they came over every day and bombed. So uh, that's a presentation on that. Thank you. In our midst here, we have, of course, we've always been blessed with having a lot of people who have been there and done that. And our next speaker here is particularly a close friend of mine who, if you'll excuse the expression, was a Navy pilot. <laughs> I'd like to introduce Ken, come on forward, Ken Martz. He doesn't have a chance. <laughs> he only wished he could be a Navy pilot. <laughs> uh, Tucker, would you come up for just a minute? This is one of the uh, gimmicks that I do in front of a group like this, is you look at me and you say, how did this old guy ever crawl into this Hellcat or Corsair. And Tucker is uh, 17 years old and just a nice young man. We all look somewhat like this, you know, lots of hair, <laughs> brown, he's got straight teeth, he doesn't, he doesn't have a pot belly like some of us, and he stands erect. And uh, we look like this once upon a time. And these are the guys that crawled into the uh, B-17 out there and the B-24 and did all that and uh, uh, it's nice to know that you're still around and in one piece. Thank you very much, Tucker. <laughs> well, it sort of keeps things in perspective because uh, uh, it is tough for you guys to imagine uh, what these fellows, these veterans have, have did a long time ago. Um, I was not in the uh, Turkey shoot, uh, but I was fortunate enough to have five of the fellows that were in it, they were on the Bella Wood, and it was in the middle of the uh, Truck Island. And uh, they were pulled back to the States and had the little R&R, &R, and we had the good fortune to have them join our squadron, the VF-24. We were fighter pilots flying the Hellcat, and uh, these five fellows joined us and it gave us the advantage of knowing what we were going to be up against once we got out. We, we ended up in Okinawa, and if anybody comes back here in uh, February 5th, I think Blaine would like to have me do a little talk on Okinawa, which I'm very familiar with, with the kamikazes, etc. But uh, these five fellows were uh, uh, very responsible for shooting down, I think the total of these guys was something like uh, 16 aeroplanes, 16 Japs, now I, I'm Japanese, and I have to say this about, I have to say, I, I, drive a, I drive a Toyota, so don't worry about it. <laughs> uh, but, I, I think our Navy was uh, impressed that they spent a lot of money on us, teaching us to fly and, and hopefully uh, swim at times. Um, but uh, they built this um, uh, Hellcat, the F-6F, uh, purely to bring the pilot down back. I say that because it had armor behind our seat, they had armor underneath. We had thick glass as far as the windshield was concerned. 
and we had uh, self-sealing uh, fuel tanks. So um, uh, we were responsible probably for uh, being able to get back to our carrier. And in the case of the truck uh, turkey shoot, as a matter of fact, one of the fellows that came off the Bella Wood was the one that coined the word the turkey shoot. He said he'd never seen so many enemy planes and such a wonderful opportunity to to uh, fire his guns at something besides a tow target, which is what we, we used to uh, train with. But uh, we used to have some fun times uh, when they joined the squadron. We'd sit around the old club after we had a <coughs> just getting over a cold. Um, we'd sit at the old club and of course we had the little gold bars. Uh, we were ensigns and these guys were lieutenants and, Theirs were all rusty looking and so on. We, we learned that if we put our instant bars in salt water and made them look like we'd been around for a while. So, I, I, we, we'd sit there and, and hear their stories. And, and uh, of course, I, I can only remember two or three of them. I can't even remember what I had for breakfast. But, uh, but one of the stories had to do with uh, one of my buddies, his name was Blackie. And uh, so Blackie was, uh, being chased by one of the uh, jab zeros out there, and he couldn't seem to shake it off. And what he did was he went on down on the water between the, our carriers, and we had Marines on board with very good sharp shooters and so on. And they they ended up shooting the, the uh, jab zero down, and I, probably the whole crew on the ship probably took credit for shooting that down. But uh, uh, at any rate. Uh, we realize that this is one way of, of uh, surviving. So, you know, you sort of make up these things as you go along. You don't need them in the textbook. And, and by having our own experienced pilots from the Bella Wood, it helped a great deal. Uh, having said that, uh, one of the best pilots, uh, when we were uh, uh, just getting ready to uh, launch a bunch of planes, uh, his name was Kelly. He was probably the best pilot that we'd seen in a long time. He came in for a landing on the carrier, and the carrier was still turning. And he got a, a wave off because the landing signal officer knew it was maneuvering, and he flew right into the uh, superstructure, and that was the end of him. So uh, it wasn't the easiest thing to do to get on and off that carrier. Uh, Bob re referred to the uh, uh, the ship with all the uh, planes on there, and all of our launches were out, were uh, catapulted. Uh, when, when I was in the, what they call a Jeep carrier, and uh, we didn't have much speed, and if you didn't have any wind over the deck, it was really terrible. So you had to get launched by the catapult, which worked out fine. Uh, you just had to, by the way, whenever you see these airplanes landing here, at least the uh, Hellcat and the Corsair, we always left the uh, hood open. And the reason for that is if we went in the water, it was one less thing we had to worry about uh, getting out of there. By the way, do we have any Navy pilots in the audience here? Right here. A couple over there. Oh, thank you for being there. Um, let's see, what, what do we got? Well, this is my carrier. <laughs> And it used to be a Sacconi uh, oil tanker, if you can believe that. In fact, we were the first ship to refuel destroyers and cruisers at sea. But they had so much fuel on board there, so uh, it was quite an experience. But uh, uh, So let's see, are there any questions? I'm sort of jumping around on this whole subject, but Blaine thought maybe uh, I knew a little bit about that area out there. And uh, yeah, we sailed by it, but uh, we went on up to Okinawa. So, uh, but if anybody has any questions, I'll be happy to answer them. Okay, okay, yes, sir. Uh, Let me bring this over to you. Everybody can hear. A dispute about Bull Halsey, and that he went chasing after the enemy and then wasn't in the right spot when he needed to be. Could you tell us more about that? I can't, I can, but I've been blamed man that Matt can do that. I'll drop the ball in his lap. Bob Andrade uh, runs the library upstairs, and if any of you folks 
have failed to see that library, I want to encourage you to go up and see it before you go home. Uh, Dave Thompson over here and, and uh, Bob, they've done a magnificent job and it's well worth a moment to go up and take, even have an elevator if you need to get up there. Uh, Bob, will you answer his question, please? Yeah, what had, what had happened was the, uh, the, stuff, the that Battle of uh, Lake Gulf. Uh, at the Battle, battle of the, uh, you know, the Philippine Sea, the Japanese lost all of their airplanes. I mean, they, they had none left. And uh, uh, during the battle, uh, uh, I'm trying to think of his name, Onishi, Onishi I think was the name, that, that, that took a, a carrier, carrier's force up uh, and Halsey chased them. It was a bad judgment because they didn't have any planes on it, but it was called a decoy. They wanted to decoy him way. He was in Task Force 34. And it had the famous message from, from, from Nimitz is Task Force 34, where are you? The world wants to know. And that's a quote from, from that. And uh, that, that's what happened. He, uh, he had bad judgment. He had a few bad judgments. He's a great, great man, but he made a few mistakes. But that's, that's what happened in that case right there. Thank you, Bob. Uh, one other story, the uh, uh, boys that had been out in the Bellow Wood, they told about uh, they were in a flight pattern ready to come around to land. And lo and behold, who was out there but a Japanese Zero. And turned out his carrier was on fire. He may not have known how to swim, and he figured, what the heck, I'll get aboard the carrier and take care of it. Uh, the, the Marines on, uh, on the ship decided they weren't sure whether he may have before the word terrorist came out, they weren't sure whether he might do some damage to the carrier, so they shot him down in the in the uh, flight path there. And I I hope somebody did save him because uh, we we didn't believe in shooting people down in parachutes or sitting out in the water, and uh, we were lucky to win the war with that attitude. But anyway, I think that's pretty much all I can say. Nice seeing you all here. Thank you for making the effort to come out here. Thank you. Uh, you know, Ken always likes to make that story about uh, <laughs> how we couldn't land on carriers. And it's almost, but not quite right. The word was wouldn't, not couldn't. I figured that when I took off, when I came home, I wanted that runway exactly where it was when I left it. <laughs> now who's smart? One of the things that I like to do, there, there's so much that goes on about World War II veterans. And it involves me because I was there. Many, many years ago, I went to my first reunion, first military reunion. It was in Fort Myers, Florida. It was Saturday morning. We'd already had a Friday night banquet and this sort of thing. And it was Saturday morning and we're sitting in this little hotel room that we call a hospitality room. And at that time, there were probably about 20 of us sitting in there and just not doing anything, drinking coffee and messing around. And all of a sudden, one of the guys started telling a story. And he got about halfway through the thing and then just quit talking. And it was quiet in there for a little while. And somebody said, what, what about the rest of it? And he said, well, it just occurred to me that maybe that isn't what really happened. Maybe that's just the way I remembered it. And somebody else said, that's the way I remembered it. And somebody else said, yeah, that's right. That's what we did. 
and all of a sudden, it was just like someone opened the floodgates. And for the first time in over 50 years, that whole room full of people individually talked about World War II for the first time. And, and it's kind of nice because there were so many things that happened in World War II that nobody needs to make up a story. And I have heard in all the 14 years and something that I've been down here, and we've had hundreds, thousands of World War II veterans come through, and I can name you two stories out of there that I don't believe. Because it really did happen. And so it's nice to be able to pass on to our younger generation. You know, we were termed the greatest generation. Well, maybe that's because we had the opportunity to be the greatest generation. But it's not meant to belittle anything that came after us. Because some of us went into other things afterwards and found out that those were great generations too. So I, I thought I would like to close my portion of the program here with a little poem that kind of tells a story. And it, it's really about green pilots, who we also recognize as allies, incidentally. It's a clear, cool dawn at Guadalcanal as the sky announces the day. To the east, there's warmth in pink and blue. To the west, it's cold and gray. From high above comes the fading sound of a mighty engine's roar. Mechanic release, relax our ceaseless work to scan the skies once more. Too early yet for the dawn patrols return from a rendezvous. Too early yet for bombers and TBS. They're still out there in the blue. Can't be Japs, we'd be warned by now. They're a cinch for the radar screens. Oh hell. Let's finish this engine change. They're much too high to be seen. The hum of motor fades away to the ever-brightening sky, and the work of war goes on again. Men sweat and fight and die. What planes are these? What pilots would fly on this phantom patrol at dawn? Too high to be seen by the human eye, their invisible echelon. Those on earth might never know, but ask the man who flies, has he ever seen these mystery planes in his travels through the skies? The pilot lights a cigarette. For a moment, his face is grim. And a faraway look comes into his eyes as he tells them what they mean to him. Oh yes, I've seen these mystery planes in the misty shades of dawn. To us, they're more than a phantom flight as the days of the war go on. For the pilots who fly these silvery ships are friends from near and far. They never come close enough to view, but we well know who they are. That's a Bobby Rice and good old Heen. They've flown for many a mile, and old Tex Rankin cheers our day with his happy-go-lucky smile. Sylvester, Stivers, Baker, and Boyle, they're part of this echelon. With a knowing smile, they say, cheer up. Don't act as though we're gone. Cap Flanagan, <coughs> Cap Flanagan's there with his boyish grin. I never did see him frown. And Colonel Cook leads a silver flight of our boys who've all gone down. Yet some will say they've all passed on to an airfield in the sky, but they still reform each day at dawn to joke and fight and fly. No words describe their worth to us. No speech has ever expressed the qualities of true friendship which they alone possessed. <coughs> so let's not try to write out thoughts, but from our hearts extend the highest tribute man can pay to a true and faithful friend. It's a clear, cool dawn at Guadalcanal as the sky announces the day. To the east, there's warmth in pink and blue. To the west, it's cold and gray. From high above comes the fading sound of a mighty engine's roar, and mechanics relax their ceaseless work to scan the skies once more. Thank you.
Well, thank you very much, Mr. Mack, Mr. Andrade, Mr. Marks. Excellent program today. Don't you think, folks? We've got some more fun in store for us today in about a little less than a half an hour. The uh, jet sitting outside here, the T-33, was going to take off and do a flight for us. But before any of that happens, we've also got Palm Desert Choir here for us, Palm Desert High School Choir. And we've also got the Cathedral City High School Color Guard who's going to come in in just a moment to retire the colors. So if you'd all please rise. Thank you again, ladies and gentlemen. Join us outside in just a few minutes. Our chief pilot, Joe Shield, is going to talk to us a little bit about the jet that's going to fly, and then, of course, he's going to fly it. <laughs> <laughs> 